I work at at Canarad, the, the centre with the long, long name there, and I'll be your your host, um, you know, this evening. Um, firstly, this is a very warm, warm welcome. I'm so pleased to see so many of the, the academics in the house. We normally have a lot of students, but uh, it's great to have a, a balance in in the house. Um, this is the first first book launch as part of the Emancipatory Imaginations Winter School series that is that that is uh, underway on the bir on the Bird Street uh, 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 the campus. It's um, it's co-hosted by Professor Dina Zoe Belugi of Queen's University Belfast. I saw her over there and uh, the North Mandela University under the able uh, the leadership of Professor, Professor Kiert and uh, the Krishet team. We have great um, um, academics in, a, in the audience who have come from near and far, including Ghana, the UK, India, Ireland, Kenya, Uganda, and Canada, maybe? Yeah. So, um, welcome, welcome to you all. So, um, just as I do part of part of the welcome year, um, I want to acknowledge our deputy vice chancellor, people and operations, Lebohan Hashatse. Uh, I'm not sure. Yo, here he is. Oh, uh, Thank you for coming. And uh, as you can see, we we have there are, there are lots of academics in the house. I'm going to do the, as I welcome the national South, South African contingent together with our local staff and, and students. You all are welcome. And as we say, to, to cover ourselves, all protocol of the, Okay, just in case you leave somebody out. Um, we do, of course, have a very special welcome to the panelists tonight. <coughs> Dr. Dr. Edith Pas Paswana, Professor Katija Koza Shang Shang Shangase, and Ms. Mot Motla Lepule Natane Tuvela, who will be introduced more fully later on by Nomta Nomta Mei, who is my my co kind of uh, facilitator tonight. Now, um, just in terms of some opening. Comments. I think we we remember tonight the late Tony, you know Tony Morrison, who inspired so many of us with her beloved uh, the bluest eye song of of Solomon. And um, I came across a little book of hers the other day called Race. And in this book, she has a couple of headings that I thought res you know resonated with the whether the author's work in the book that we're going to be, be hearing about. There were four headings, or chapter headings, or whatever you want to call it. One of them went, no more running from nothing. I will never run from another thing on this earth. Number two, racial strife. The word made me think of a bird, a big shrieking bird out of one trillion BC. Number three, what good is a man's life if he can't even choose what to die for? And lastly, he does not see her because for him there is nothing to see. Um, this is a, a couple that were, as you read the book, and I'm just into introducing you gently to the, the book, you will find that there's some resonance um, with some of the thinking of that great, great author, Tony, you know, Tony Morrison. Um, I'm not going to go on too long. I want to make a couple of comments just in terms of opening up the space. Um, we have some great, 
some great accomplished women with us here tonight. We want to hear their stories. They have lessons to, to share with us about prizing open the, the doors of the academy. The book required deep you know, reflection, a challenge uh, uh, assumptions, and it surfaced mixed emotions. It's a book where 10 of the 12 authors are black women. That in itself is, is, is something novel in this country of ours. I found myself thinking about Phyllis Ntantala's A Life's Mosaic as she navigated the political and uh, academic world of an earlier generation with a more famous possibly husband, A.C. Jordan, and how, how patriarchy was ever, ever prevalent. There are big, big questions being, being posed in this book as we sit here in 2019, 25 years since the transition to political democracy. I was asking myself how different a path could we, would we have, have traversed had we had a rupture, i.e. closed our universities for a year in 1994 and sent everyone to go learn from the people, to go teach literacy in some rural areas as, as the Cubans did from January to <coughs> December 1961. It moved them from a position of, of literacy of 60% to 95%, which they've been able to maintain up to today. What if we had a Truth Commission? You people may have known about it, uh, the TRC. What if we had a TRC in the academy? Would we have been, been better off understanding um, of the um, complicity of academics and institutions with, with apartheid? These, these questions were, were swirling through my head as the effects of the choices uh, made on human beings inside the apartheid, post-apartheid, neo-colonial institutions are laid bare in these 12 um, you know, 12 studies. Why were people in the academy so complacent in the period leading up to the student-led, you know, the, 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 fallest, you know, the fallest movement? There were always people who were challenging dominant Western to, 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 uh, kind of discourse in um, education, <clears throat> but they were operating from the margins not necessarily inside the academy, as claimed claim Sudin, as he, he, he testifies in his, late, his, um, his latest book called The Cape, Cape Radicals. Expectations were really high for a new path, a better world, as so many authors drew on the, these authors sitting here and others in the book, drew on the work of, of Freire and speak about searching how to humanize these spaces that we spend so much of our time in. Now, I've got a little bit on each of them, but I'm not going to go through it in too much detail. I'm not, I'd rather for them to, to raise it. Edith, Dr. Edith speaks about the zone of non-being. She talks about relative to British-born black academics, black African and Caribbean immigrants were the preferred other within the racialized British Academy, while the former became the quintessential other. When you think about you, uh, you Shirley, and your work on, on the Caribbean, as well as your work, of course, with black women's, you know, women's bodies. And I'm glad that you're in the house uh, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, intergenerational mix of, um, of academics. Um, how do we do humanity? She poses that question. I'm going to stop there. And Prof. Uh, Mukatija, 
your, your work is in audiology. And uh, it struck a note with me because I'm, you know, I'm, wearing, I'm wearing hearing aids. And I've, I've got to imagine you know, how, how to navigate certain things. But you use this word, auto -to toxicity, and talk about toxins. And there's a, there's, a, there's a comment that you make that is quite scary, I would say, you know. I'm just looking for my, for my specs here. It says, I believe no therapy is available to reverse the toxic damage that the academy, as it stands, has inflicted on academics, specifically black academics. Now, I would like to be op optimistic. And um, I'm hoping that you're going to unpack that for us. And then, of course, you also speak about why I may have become an angry black woman. <laughs> um, so, what La Leferi, you speak about sitting on one bum. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm hoping that you're going to explain that for us. Because it's an idiom, you know, in in Sesotho, uh, the struggle of survival and, and belonging. Um, but one of the pieces that, <coughs> that struck me was your comment about women in South Africa remaining on the periphery of knowledge production and, one of, and are often not taken seriously as the, you know, um, a producer of knowledge. Those are just a couple of comments. There was this, there's such a, a rich tapestry in the book that uh, I'm hoping that you're going to read it. There's even some poetry in the book. I'm going to ask Nomta to read a piece for us. I initially thought of a piece from Tony Morrison, but then we came across this piece in the book, um, this, uh, this poem. I'm going to ask her to, uh, to read it to us later. Thank you. Leadership, 
and development in Africa. Our second panelist is Prof. Katija Koza Shangase. Prof. Katija Koza Shangase is an associate professor and former HOD in speech pathology and um, audiology. She is the first and to date only black African to be awarded a PhD in her field. Can you just marry it in that <laughs> and the first in the country to be an associate professor. A member of a number of committees and boards at discipline, school faculty, university, and national level. She plays an important leadership role in her profession beyond the university, particularly within the Health Professions Council of South Africa. She has been nominated for various awards and won many, particularly in the area of research and best contribution to the field. Her research focuses on HIV and AIDS, TB, pharmacology, and early intervention in the audiology, and her numerous publications continue to be the main audiology evident from developing countries. She has taught several courses at both undergraduate and postgraduate level, and has fully engaged in the curriculum development of many courses, both as a lecturer and an HOD, as well as in her role as Chair of Education Committee at the HPCSA Professional Board. Mm. <laughs> and last but not least, Dr. Motanukule Natane. Dr. Motanukule Natane joined academia in 2007 as a lecturer in the Department of Social Work at the University of Midwest Rwanda. She is from Everton Township and a first generation graduate in her family. Her father was a mine worker and, and a mother a domestic worker. Both parents valued education and were intentional in making limited resources available for their children to get an education. She is involved in a number of research collaborations on fatherhood. Dr. Murta Lekula um, has a special interest in following um, areas such as youth development, social justice, gender, race, and fatherhood. She is in the final stages of a PhD in the study of human and community development in the faculty of humanities and Earth. Her research topic is on female hidden household experiences of father's absence. Let us welcome the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, I'm going to hand over now to the you know, panelists. Um, we're going to let them um, speak, and we'll ask you to make notes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then we'll, you can you can pose your questions afterwards. Um, uh, you have between 10, you know, 10 minutes and fifteen and fifteen minutes. We have a um, uh, unfortunate situation where the only mic that seems to be working there is this one over here which means there's a bit <coughs> of a musical sort of chairs that you have to play as you... As we were better then. You were better off that side. Yes. Okay, it's fine. Over. <coughs> it's fine. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank, uh, good afternoon, or is it good evening, everyone? And thank you very much, Alan, uh, for this generous introduction, and also to you, Nolita. Um, and uh, before I can speak, I think I was surprised. Where do you get this biography that you are reading? Because that's not, I mean, I think a lot of uh, things have changed for, for all of us yeah. here, but that's fine. We send them uh, really uh, updated uh, biographies, that's fine. But let me first uh, also uh, acknowledge <coughs> Krishat and Conrad and also Queen's University uh, for for this uh, for hosting this book launch, thank you very much. We didn't know about some of you, but the fact that uh, you read the book and you wanted us to be here, we really really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and also I want to also uh, acknowledge the HSRC for publishing this book, the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Science in this country, also for funding a bigger project which also resulted in this book uh, to the contribute and the authors, 
the core editors and all of them for their bravery because this was not an easy task to to really undertake and I think when you start a project like this and you get people to join it they really affirm you and I think I want to acknowledge those people today and also our families I think uh, my colleagues here will, will agree that our families also went through a lot at rough time with us as well during the process of this book. And all the universities in this country that hosted the dialogues that we ran, and I, was not, I didn't come to the one that uh, took place here, but my colleague um, Hugo Kenham and uh, Grace also were here for, for these specific ones. And uh, we also thank the University of Nelson Mandela to really host this uh, dialogue as well. I think the conception of this book actually came out of those dialogues that we went throughout the country trying to understand black experiences. And uh, I think we were not really prepared as a group when we started uh, this at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, we, we were actually invited to speak to young medical doctors uh, young medics or who actually um, are trying to enter the academic space. Black, they call it Harambe. The organization is called Harambe. It's an organization that uh, started to organize young medical doctors, black young medical doctors who have aspiration to become academics. It prepares them into the academic space because this was happening because of the realization that many of them, sharp as they are, ran away from academia, they run into practices, they don't want to teach, and therefore they uh, render the space impenetrable for black. So we went there, and I guess we were not ready at the time. This was 20. 14 or 2015, I can't remember, Katisha. 2015, yeah. So we were not ready. Uh, that's all I can say. We were not ready even for this project. That's when we realized we are not even ready even for this project, ourselves emotionally and otherwise. So let me talk about the book. I guess the book is important in many ways in the wake of the struggle for Africanization, decolonization, and transformation of, of the academy in South Africa. And I guess also well for the other backdrop of the Folies movement, which somehow also was instrumental in terms of framing the debate on transformation, reframing it. Because I think since 1997, since the white paper on transformation, our universities have been skating around these issues on tra of transformation. And there, were, there was a, actually a period of impasse, of silence, complete silence in terms of talking about transformation. But people were actually stewing and frying in their spaces. Uh, this book somehow, in this book as you read it, you are going to be confronted with the persisting legacy of apartheid social relations within these universities of ours. As you read some of the chapters, in this 226 pages volume with 13 chapters, you will come across what many of our academics are going through. Humiliation, dehumanization, belittling, juniorization, and so on and so forth. And this is happening to some of our first generation scholars in their families. So even when they go home, they have nowhere to fall. They have no form of support. There are experiences of alienation within these spaces, in my view, is sickening. You will meet individuals who have worked very hard and fought very hard to be where they are. The least you would expect as you read these chapters is to meet them again, having to contend 
with other new forms of struggles as they enter the university, which is supposed to be the space of enlightenment, <coughs> intellectualism, and so on and so on. I think Professor Mage has a better way of explaining the social relations at our university as barbarism in higher education. He had to write a whole book and chapter many years ago. I think someone like me was very young and at the time maybe I was still a project of someone who was <laughs> supposed to be a, a supervisor and uh, I was being shaved and I think these are the types of book I wouldn't have read at the time. <laughs> because I was someone's project there, I was being molded into something. And now I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a university mistake, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so the, blue, the book, sorry, Black Academics, provides contemporary analysis of the state of blackness in South African University using first-hand experiences in the form of autobiographical work. So autobiography for us was very important here, yeah, very, very important. And we did it, and we did it deliberately. Mm -hmm. Writing the self is never an easy endeavor, as I say, because it leaves you exposed and vulnerable. And the writing of this book certainly was not a modest project. And we were very, very aware from the onset. So we are also not oblivious of the fact that this book is going to ruffle feathers and even make other people uncomfortable. And we have gone through those emotions ourselves throughout the production of this book, throughout the dialogues. And the stories in these books will open up contributors for further scrutiny by others because they leave you exposed and because these are still lived narratives for some yeah. of them and where most of the contributors continue to experience what they have shared in the book. And, but in any case, we had to do it because the gains outweighs the pains that uh, many of our, our colleagues go through in many spaces. So the book also grapples with the, the notion of, uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, black leadership within uh, our, our university spaces and also within uh, uh, South Africa as a whole, which continues to engineer and reproduce new categories of blackness, which re results in further bifurcations of ethnicity. And as you will see in the different chapters, emerging categories of blackness in post-apartheid South Africa are more complicated than, uh, than ever as the new migrant comes into our spaces, as, uh, uh, I mean, as, 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 as we tend to even think that some people are not black, are blacker than others. Or some, or are, some, are, ha, some are the better blacks, some are 100% Zulu. So, so it gets even more complicated. And as you will see, also that it is clear from the reading of the stories in this book that Fanon was right when he pointed out the invasion of blackness was basically about questioning the very humanity of black people. And therefore blackness as a category is invented just to dismember, to use the concept that uh, Ngugi Wationgo uses, to dismember others from the human race. And uh, also Jeffrey Boyk, Boykir, he's Ghanaian of a Ghanaian descent in the UK. He's, he even said, I, I don't describe myself as black minority ethnic group because it ignores the nuances of identity that help me to better understand myself within the broader context of that category we call black. So in this book, you'll be exposed to racism, patriarchy, sexual and gender violence, nationality, all as colonial matrices of power to make sense of 
our exclusion from systems of power and knowledge in that academy. It touches all 